Good afternoon, Girl Scout Network. I'm Ava Castleton, Manager of Alum Events at Girl Scouts of the USA, and I am so excited to present to you our Campfire Chat, Journal Writing in Quarantine, our first event with Girl Scout alum, memoirist, and former books editor of Oprah.com, Lee Newman. Lee has edited some of America's favorite writers, from Toni Morrison to Brene Brown, and her techniques are sure to help you too. We're looking forward to getting started with this event shortly. We also wanted to let you know that we'll have more scheduled events in the near future, including one with Lee, for which you can register at girlscouts.org slash campfire chats. There, you'll also find recordings of past events, which are hosted virtually and broadcast live. Now let's get started. I'm thrilled to introduce literary whiz Lee Newman, who will walk us through how to begin journaling about your life from processing your most authentic thoughts and feelings to describing the events that shape your world in ways that we hope will resonate with you for years to come. I'll be sharing your questions with Lee, so don't be afraid to type them in the question box. You can find today's worksheet in the handout section of the presentation, and it will be available at girlscouts.org slash campfire chats. Don't forget to tag social posts with hashtag campfire chats and at Girl Scouts. We can't wait to hear how you're using Lee's journaling techniques in your own lives. At the end of our broadcast, you'll have the opportunity to support Girl Scouts with cookie care, and you can find the link to the program in the chat log. Lee, it is so great to have you. Before we get started, will you tell us about your Girl Scout experience? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I started with Girl Scouts when I was super young. I did a pilot program called Pixies when I was in kindergarten, which I, I understand is not all over the country, but it was in Alaska where I grew up. And um, then I went on to Brownies. And then um, my family moved from Alaska to Baltimore. And that's when I started Girl Scouts, which I did all the way till eighth grade. Um, it was a big part of my life, I think, because I would moved from Alaska, where we did all these outdoor things. I was always fishing with my dad. I was always in the mountains. I was We were camping and hiking all the time. And then when we moved to Baltimore, it was essentially, you know, it's a very pretty city, part, part of the city, but it was a city. And, um, you know, the girls there didn't really do those things. They they played lacrosse and they um, played piano. Uh, but with the Girl Scouts, um, I would go on camping trips with them in the weekend. Our troop leader was really into it. And I, um, canoeing trips, and I got to see all these things about the the, the wildlife of Maryland that I had never seen before, you know, my, I'd never seen a snake because snakes don't live in Alaska. So um, it was a huge part of my childhood and um, amazing. Anyway. Thank you. That's so great. We're so happy to hear that. Let's get started. Okay, great. Um, so I just, uh, I'm so happy to have everybody here to talk about journaling because I, I do think it is such like an important and um, uh affirming activity to do especially when we're all kind of stuck in our houses um there's very little physical space for a lot of us uh, even if we have a big house I, my house is you know not huge but there are children everywhere and when there's not children there's also dogs and i have chickens i mean ev everybody's all over the place so journaling is a way to carve out some space for yourself and um one of the things that really anybody can do it a lot of my friends are, you know, um, they are knitting wonderful uh, uh, scarves or they're making uh, the masks with the sewing machine or they're drawing. I have one friend who makes beautiful animal drawings um, and a beautiful writing notebook. But um, to do those things, you sort of need a lot of training and sometimes you need some talent. And I don't have either one of those uh, things. I have neither talent nor I have any training in very many artsy things. But I can write and um, I think anybody can. We just have to sort of allow ourselves to do it not feel intimidated by it and give ourselves a little bit of time. Um, with that said, um, I, I think they've told me if you have any questions, you can chat them, you can type them in and ask me questions if I'm going too quickly or you want some more information about anything, please, 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 please step in. Um, one of the things I also like about journaling is that you don't actually need a journal. Um, I know that the funnest part of journaling is to go to a really beautiful store and get a gorgeous pink leather beautiful notebook with a pen that you know glows in the dark or whatever your style is um 
but right now, of course, we can't really go shopping for those kind of things. Um, not a good idea. Um, but also, um, you don't really need it. Um, if you do get one, I like to use smaller notebooks like this instead of the big, beautiful one, because then I can put it in my purse. I can take it wherever I go. If I'm waiting for my kids to do something, I can write in that little notebook instead of, you know, just checking my phone, checking my phone, checking my phone. Just a better use of my time. Um, another way I journal is to just keep a stack of scrap paper. Actually, this is scrap paper, which is the stationery of the guy that uh, owned my house before me, and he just left a big box of it. And I keep the scrap paper by my bedside so that if I wake up in the middle of the night or I'm having something that won't let me sleep, I'll just write all about it on these little pieces of paper and I literally throw them on the floor. In the morning, I wake up and take those pieces of paper and I stick them in a box or I stick them in a drawer. Um, I don't really want to look at them again because I think for me, the point of the process is just to kind of, you know, get it out and move on. But if you did want to, you'd, you'd be able to find them. and and that way you don't need to like get out of bed and run, go find a special notebook. Um, the quicker you get to the writing, the more fun it is and the more valuable it is. Um, and that's the thing about journaling. It really is valuable. You know, there's been a lot of studies about why, what it does for us and why we need to do it, um, why it's so helpful. So um, it's been proven to help with people who have chronic conditions like asthma, chronic pain. It's supposed to help with that. It also helps with stress relief. And depression and I know that right now in this really weird 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 period we are in there is a lot of stress and I think there are a lot of like depressed feelings that we have when we can't go out and we can't see the people we love and we're afraid that you know everyone's gonna get sick and we're worried about money so um, journaling can help us work through these feelings you know obviously in most obvious ways um, but also what it does um, in terms of like psychology is it's supposed to help us create what's called a cogent narrative of our life. So that means it allows us to look at all these different things and in our minds create a story of our life that we understand and that we value and that we might actually even go ahead and try and live out in the future. So for example, um, at Duke University, there was a bunch of researchers and what they did was they took all these kids um, who had just entered Duke and the kids were absolutely freaked out. They felt that they weren't smart enough. They felt that they didn't fit in, that they should go home. They weren't ready for college. All these different feelings that you have when you move away for the first time in your life, obviously you're in a high pressure environment and the journalists, I mean, the researchers had them journal, just journal. They didn't tell them what to journal. They just wanted them to journal every day and write about their feelings, their thoughts, their day. And after uh, a couple of weeks, it turns out that these kids began to do much better in school. They began to make friends. They began to get better grades. They began to socialize in a way that the kids who had not journaled were not doing. So, um, you know, I think we can do as well as some college students. I think we can use the same technique. Um, uh, is there any questions just before I go on? Because I had some really cool exercises that um, we can use to create better quality journaling rather than just laundry lists of our time. That's great, yeah. We had a question about how to overcome the pressure of starting a first entry in a journal. Yeah, well, actually, that's a great question because that's sort of what I'm about to go into because it is like, I, you know, I, I'm a writer. I write every day and you would think that it would just come out of me, you know, like honey from a, from a beautiful flower, but it doesn't, of course. I mean, there's lots of times where you sit down and you think, First of all, you think, what am I supposed to write about? And you panic and you seize up. Then you think, oh, I can't write about that because, oh my God, I can't even deal with that. Or you have, you, you worry that it's not going to be good enough. That's another huge one where you, you know, the whole point of journaling is for us to, um, just to let loose and be ourselves. But of course, I mean, if you're like me or anybody, just about anybody I know, we worry that the journaling will not be good enough for the quality of writing. For whatever reason that you get stuck, um, that's why I do think I've invented these exercises in these ways that A, will get you started writing because they sort of force you to write. And B, what you want to do is get to like a deeper, more quality level of journaling that gets you, gets your feelings out and helps you process that cognitive narrative or the, that they were talking about. Um, so the first one is one that I just invented because 
um, I am Melissa Fixiano. Um, can we pull up the slide? Status, can we pull up the slide? Great, thank you. Um, so the column to your uh, left is adjectives and the column to your right is nouns. Um, and you could change these columns. I mean, I made up these adjectives and nouns on my own, but you could copy these down and we'll put them up for you guys. Um, but what I like to do is I really am a slave to my to-do list. I don't think I'm alone. You know, I'm constantly making to-do lists all day long about the things to buy in the market or the things I want to do for work or like what I want to fix in the house or what I need to buy at the hardware store, et cetera. Um, but I don't want my journal to be like that. And I really worried that my journal was going to become like that. Um, so, but at the same time, I'm kind of into lists and I think they're great for getting to the heart of the matter, getting yourself organized in your mind so that you can write about something. So what you do is when you sit down, and I'd love to do this, the first thing I would ever do before even beginning to really write um, is to make a list of something. So one one that I love to do is number two, professional. Um, and I compare that either with one professional dreams or professional goals. You take an adjective and a noun. So I don't think about my professional dreams and goals, and I should. Um, I think that's how you get what you want out of your job or out of your, your art form. Um, and I push it up. I have all those to-do lists about the hardware store and about the, you know, needing to buy, you know, a new filter for the air purifier or whatever I'm thinking about, or do I need to get the kids' applications in to camp? but I don't ever make a to-do list about what I want out of my career and my life. And so in my journal, I do try and talk about, let's say I chose professional and dreams and I'll make a list. You know, what are my dreams? You know, is it to write another book? Yes, it is. Uh, is it to get a new agent? Is it to get a teaching job? Is it to try and write something that I've never written before instead of writing uh, a memoir? Do I want to write uh, a, kid's no a kid's novel? Um, is it to just feel better about myself? You know, I haven't always been a writer, but even in a regular job, is your dream to get a promotion, to start a job in a different state, to go back to school? Like in a very slow and easy way by making a list, you can help yourself think about that. And it will spill over into your journal entry about other things. You know, some of them, if you look at the combinations, like, I like, I, one of the words I love is secret. I just love secret, especially for, for journal writing because it makes me feel kind of delicious and a little bit naughty, but also kind of pushes me to talk about things I don't want to talk about and I wouldn't talk about in my life. So if I put, um, you know, secret accomplishments, okay, that's a good one. I chose accomplishments. Um, well, you know, I could put all kinds of things on there. Like, it's true, secret accomplishments. What have I done with my life that um, I haven't told other people? Um, well, one of them is I, I, I drove a car into a fountain when I was 16 years old and I didn't crash the car. It just landed in the fountain and then it bounced out. And my parents never knew that I'd, I'd had that accident. I consider that an accomplishment. Um, uh, some, some of these lists can also be really serious. Like I really think a great one to look at is like, um, family regrets, you know, things that you really messed up on and maybe you talk about a list of family regrets that you made, the people you didn't call, the people that you didn't fall in love with, how you yelled about things. I know we're not supposed to really regret things and stick too much on it, but sometimes it's good to look at what you didn't do that you didn't like so that you can do it differently later. Um, we can take that slide down now, Gladys. Um, our second uh, exercise is slightly different. Um, it's one that's a, like a dinner exercise. I did, um, I got it actually from Michelle Obama. I read about her doing this in an article in the newspaper with her girls, but I'm not sure she invented it. I don't know who did. It's called the rose and the thorn. And basically I do it with my kids and my family or even friends. I do it constantly with friends before dinner parties is before we eat dinner or while we're eating it, we go around the table and everybody talks about their rose, which is like the best thing that happened to you all day long and their thorn, the worst thing that happened to you all day long. And um, it doesn't have to be that dramatic and it's just about that day. So even if you had a day that was totally full of thorns, um, you know, 
you put your car in a fountain or you cut your own hair, which I did, all those thorns, um, there's usually one wonderful rose, right? And it could be small, it can be tiny. I, I literally remember one time saying my rose was that I was wearing matching socks and that I'd open up my drawer and all my socks were matched in cute little balls that my bro my son did that for me because um, he was a sweetheart. But when you're doing this in a journal, it can go to a whole other level because obviously there's roses and thorns you don't want to share with your um, with your family and that you want to go into more detail about yourself. Okay. And secondly, you can go in a lot more details when you're doing it at a dinner table. It's like you do it really quickly, you know, two sentences, three sentences, but in your journal, you could fill it up with pages if you wanted to. I like to start with the thorn because sometimes my thorn is like a huge long rant that I kind of needs to get out of me. Like yesterday, my thorn was losing my phone and then trying to use the find my phone app, which didn't work and it needed multiple, in order to find the phone, they had to send me a text message to my phone to let me know I was really Lee Newman. So if I wrote a rant about that, it kind of gets it out of my system. That's a lighthearted rant, it's not that interesting, but then it's gone from my being. Whereas my rose, you wanna do that second um, for many reasons, mostly because it, um, it has a lot to do with gratitude, what you're happy about, what happened that was wonderful in your day. And like journaling, there's been all these really wonderful studies about how gratitude helps us with our emotional lives. Um, one thing it's really great at is helping us develop resilience in our emotional lives. And right now things are so rocky, I'll take all that resilience I can get. Um, it also helps us with um, self-esteem. Let's say you cut your hair, it didn't work out the way you wanted it to. It will help you with your self-esteem to talk about a little gratitude. And it also helps with sleep. Um, interestingly enough, journaling has also been proven in uh, scientific studies to help with sleep. So when you put the two of them together and you're journaling about your gratitude, um, you're really, you know, helping yourself get out of a lot of insomnia and senseless worrying. Hopefully that would be the goal. Um, so I love to do the rose and the thorn as a journal exercise. It's so easy to do and it always like leads me to new revelations about especially right now, I wanna be grateful for what I have. You know, I really don't. Um, I know it's okay to bellyache a little bit, but I, I, we feel like whatever good I've got going, I wanna celebrate at the end of the day. Uh, that brings me to my third exercise. Can we put that one up there, Gladys? And it's called a journal prompt. Um, and I love journal prompts and I love them when they're good, but to be good, they've gotta be kind of specific. Um, I worked on a lot of the prompts here when I was at Oprah.com, um, and many of these I worked on with a wonderful writer named Cynthia Bond, who wrote a book called Ruby, which was an Oprah book pick. And um, we worked together and came up with a lot of these of these prompts. Basically, what you do is you open your journal or your scrap piece of paper, and you write the sentence out as it's written. Um, my favorite scent is blank because blank so the dot dot dots are blank and you're going to fill those in so um for example if i was going to do that i would say my favorite scent is geraniums because my mother gave them to me blah 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 and it leads you into a whole story and a whole thinking about what you're doing or why um some of them are harder um i was looking at the one on this list that said the hardest decision i ever had to make was and i mean it took me a really long time to think what that hard decision was. And I, I realized that I wasn't even sure if I'd even really ever made it. I was still halfway through making it. But if you did pick a, a decision that had been really hard to, to make and you went back and revisited it, it'd be a great way to know how to make a hard decision in the future and also to reflect whether you'd, whether you'd made the right decision. Um, a cool thing to do with these prompts is to write them all down, cut them in, on a piece of paper and then get some scissors and cut them into little strips and fold them up and put them in a bowl and then just pick one out and do it. That kind of forces you to write about something that you didn't expect to write about. And often when you write about what you didn't expect to write about, it's so much more revelatory and you somehow invest a lot more than when you actually got to pick what you wanted. Um, but you don't have to do that. I mean, it's probably going to be writing at two o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you're not going to 
cut everything up and put it in a bowl. But if you did, it'd be great. I have found it to be amazing when I was assigned a prompt and I did not know it was coming at me. Um, all right, so exercise four, right. Another thing that is really great to do with journal writing is to write a letter to someone. I actually think of it as writing an email because so few of us write a letter. And when we do, it's like a Christmas letter where everything is perfect. So I kind of feel like it's the email you will never send. Now, um, the email can be sent to someone who hurt you, that you want to go through all the things you never got to say to them about it. The email could be to a famous figure, to you know a politician that upset you, or to a movie star who did something really stupid. Uh, it could be to someone in your life that is passed away and you can't even really speak to them again, or somebody you're too afraid to really tell them all these things that you, you, you are thinking. It can also be to yourself. You can write an email to yourself that you will never send. Um, an email to when you were little or when you were older or the you that doesn't even exist yet, uh, uh, who's 20 years in the future. I like to like really make it as real as you can by saying, dear blankety blank and ending it. That's the most important thing. You know, I think that every time people finish an email, we're all thinking, oh, should I write sincerely or should I write warmly? Warm regards, best, all best. But pick something in some way that reflects your feelings about the whole letter. I think that the adios at the end of the letter or the email is very telling about the whole situation or relationship you have with that person. You could even do PSs. Why not a PS and a PPS? I love PSs. They're great. Okay. Uh, the last exercise that I find super helpful is to write about objects. I call this object writing. I wish I had a better name for it. I do not. That is to write about specific objects related to people who you're very close to. So for example, you could write um, about your mother's pocketbook, but you're not actually supposed to dissect it. You're just supposed to describe it. How big was the pocketbook? What did she keep inside it? Did she have to save up her money to buy this pocketbook because it was super special? Or did she hate it because it was given to her by her aunt, but she felt like she had to carry it? Did she have lipsticks in it? Did she take it everywhere with her? Did she have snacks in it? Or did she always forget it? A woman who forgets her pocketbook and a woman who takes her pocketbook everywhere, a woman who carries a tiny, tiny pocketbook and a woman who carries a big suitcase are totally different women. And the interesting thing is, is when you write about these objects, let's say it's your mother's pocketbook or let's say it's your father's, like my father had this cigar, uh, cigar box and he had all these swimming medals in it. Let's say I wrote about that. Or let's say I wrote about, you know, um, uh, this teacher who was really mean to me. Uh, her name was Mrs. Chantelle's Ruby. And I wrote about her weird smock that she used to wear, her artsy smock, before she would begin to yell at us. Um, if you're writing just about the object, you kind of begin to dip into all your feelings and relationships with that person much more easily than when you're just trying to talk about the person and trying to understand your relationship with them and how to make it better or how to get over them. Um, it's sort of a little portrait of something they own. I hope this has been helpful. Um, I have a lot of because they've led to a big difference in my life, um, especially when it comes to sleeping. I seriously use journaling as a sleep aid. Um, otherwise, I'm up all night, you know, having worries and thoughts I just don't need to have at that moment. Um, do we want to go into some questions that we um, we can answer? Absolutely, that'd be great. You know, one of the questions was about when you journal, so that was perfectly timed. So nighttime yeah, for you, Lee? Really, yeah, I really. There's been a lot of every like the the research and the things I've seen people say. They're like, oh, you have to. It's really important that you pick a specific time to journal. Like a lot of people suggest early morning, the way people meditate, right? Um, I don't know that that's possible. Our lives are so up and down right now. And I feel like the less rules almost, the better. You know, um, one of the things about journaling is that you can carry it with you wherever you go. So in the exact same time you pick up your cell phone, you'd be journaling instead in those 
few moments. Um, it's hard to do anything in the middle of the day. It really is. I think people's day, even though we're all at home, still kind of gets busy. I like to do it before I go to sleep or even my favorite is not to, I mean, if I was smart, I would do it before I go to sleep and then I would sleep really easily. But instead, of course, what I do is watch some Netflix and then I fall asleep and then I wake up at, in midnight a little bit worried and then I journal and then I can go back to sleep. So um, I don't think it's so important when you do it. I think it's important that you, or even that you do it for X amount of pages or X amount of minutes. I do not believe that is important. I believe it's important that you do it in an in-depth quality way that reflects your inner life and the things that are involved with you. Um, that's all that's important. Great. So then to so then you'd be answering Anne's question as to whether or not a journal entry needs to be a certain length. No, I don't think it needs to be a certain length. I mean, I, I think you need to write long enough to get yourself into the space. I think there are very few people that come come out of the gate in the first four sentences and bear their soul. I just don't think that happens. I think you write about some blah blah, even with the like prompts and the things that are guiding you towards a more thoughtful um revelation or you know discussion you're still going to talk about it you still have to warm up a little bit so i'd probably say you know at least give yourself make yourself write you know a full paragraph before you quit awesome do you have any thoughts on handwriting versus typing journal entries i do but i don't know whether to, i'm allowed to say them i just feel like it should be handwritten and it's it's not because I'm old, it's true, I'm in my 40s, so maybe I'm like handwriting, but I know I have read studies in the past about the brain-hand connection and how the physical part of that process, um, you know, cre stimulates more creativity. I'm, I'm low, I am totally improvising on that study, I don't remember, but I know I read it. Um, I personally type books and articles and essays by on the computer. Um, I, I got my first computer when I was like 13 or 14, and I've to completely, I don't even know if I could write a story or uh, an essay or an article on a, without being on the computer because my hands are like, my tippity tappity hands are, you know, my brain is going like that, but I'm correcting. But typing something professionally is totally different than journal writing because you're not editing your journal writing. You're just, just pooping it out and going for it versus when we type, I think we correct. And there's those red lines that show us what we've misspelled. And uh, we worry about periods. And there's just a lot more. The computer itself is correcting it and perfecting it. And journaling is about the opposite of perfection. It's just going for it. So I feel I feel like it's also just easier. Like, can you imagine waking up in the middle of the night and being worried about something or being on your way to driving somebody somewhere and being like, oh, I'm going to pull out my computer and journal? You know, whereas I just love the freedom of 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 pulling out a pad and sc scratching it down. You know, the same thing, you know, like scuba diving versus just swimming. You just jump out of the boat into the water versus putting on all that equipment. Um, I, 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 of course, think everything is right for every single person. However you do it that works for you, you need to just do it that way. But for me personally, uh, I like the hand penned thing. Thank you so much, Lee. That's the last question we have time for today, but we can't wait to have you back. And I hope that everybody who's on and who had questions that didn't get answered will also join us uh, in the future and ask those questions to Lee moving forward. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, guys. I hope you have a, a good uh, good uh, journaling experience. And I'm, thanks for having me. Excellent. Girl Scouts, honestly, it's such a great, I mean, I'm so, so, so happy that you asked me. I, I like there's I constantly think about how much I love Girl Scouts and I'm I'm so glad that you guys gave me this opportunity to talk to to other ladies. Back at you. And thank you everyone for inviting the Girl Scout Network into your homes. We'll be hosting a wide variety of campfire chats. So be sure to stay up to date with our offerings at girlscouts.org slash campfire chats. You won't want to miss out on our event next Tuesday, networking for today and tomorrow with Girl Scout alum Anne Choquette, former editor-in-chief of Seventeen and author of The Big Life. In the meantime, you can support Girl Scouts with Cookie Care, which allows you to buy boxes online and have them shipped safely to your home or donate them directly to first responders on the front line of COVID-19. 
Your generosity will also help support the 1.7 million Girl Scouts, depending on the cookie program, to fund life-changing girl-led programs. The link was posted in the chat log and is also going to be included in the follow-up email to today's event, or you can buy them now at girlscouts.org slash cookie care. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to welcoming you back at our next event.